Insert the music here. Insert the music here. All right. Good evening and welcome to Merriweather's World. I am your host, Dr. Mark Merriweather Vorderbrug and broadcasting from kind of the dining room, kind of the sitting room, kind of in between places as usual. Uh, cool. For those of you who don't know me, I am the creator of Foraging Texas. Let me put that up there. Author of Idiot's Guide Foraging, uh, currently medicine man for the Medicine Man Plant Company. Let me throw that up there. Uh, and general all-around scientist dad egomaniac type dude. Okay, that's that's pretty much me. Hey, good morning, Kathleen. Good morning, Mike. Yeah, yeah. I needed a hair trim, I shaved, you know, well, parts. But uh, as, as much as I wanted my hair to get really long, get the mohawk really, really long, my hair has a tendency to twist into really big ringlets and just kind of goes out until gravity takes over after about it growing 18 inches, then it drops. And so I decided, uh, okay, let's, let's, let's have a respectable haircut. All right. Hey, Sherry. Hey, Kelly. Hey, Melody. Hey, Sherry. Did I say good morning? I meant this afternoon, uh, this evening, whatever. It's nature has no time. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Diana. All right. So as usual, before we start the Hackberries, and there's a lot to talk about Hackberries, uh, normal housekeeping, shout out to my sponsors, things like that. But first, uh, now with the cool weather coming, classes are starting up again. And so those of you who are wondering where you can find me in person, uh, here is the list over on the Foraging Texas website. Uh, those of you in the Austin area, East Texas, lucky to be you. Uh, even San Antonio, because San Antonio isn't that far from Austin. Uh, those of you in the Houston area, eh, things are still kind of closed down here, so we're not sure what's happening. Uh, okay, also for those of you who want to see everything from the past... We have the Merryweather's YouTube channel, and not only is the Merryweather's world and the donut shop at the beginning of the world on there, uh, there's also a whole bunch of videos on emergency preparedness and videos shot during different plant classes and just all sorts of stuff like that. Hey, good morning, Joe. Hey, Brendan. Hey, Brendan. Uh, for some reason, when you leave comments for me on YouTube, YouTube marks them as spam, and I haven't figured out how to unmark them and actually respond to you. So if you're wondering why I've been ignoring you, that's why. Okay, so it's not me. Uh, okay. Um, ba -bum -ba -bum. Of course, I, I, I already put it up once, but I'll put it up again. As I mentioned, I am the medicine man now at Medicine Man Plant Company. Uh, currently we have the liver pill and the brain pill out and hopefully, well, possibly as soon as the end of next week, but more likely the week after that, the immune pill will finally be out. So really, really excited about that. Okay. Uh, other thing, like I mentioned my book. Idiot's Guide Foraging, and just a reminder, I don't get any royalties from this. So if you just go like just to some random Amazon link and purchase it, I get nothing out of it. Uh, well, okay, my ego gets even bigger, but you know my kids would probably prefer uh, that that doesn't happen. But if you follow the specific link I posted, Amazon gives me a sale or like a finder sales commission sort of thing on it of 74 cents. 74 cents. So yeah, but it has to come from that specific link that I just posted. All right. What else do we got? Oh, so, uh, and then if you want to see my recommended, uh, choices for foraging books, plant identification books, camping gear, hurricane survival, apocalyptic survival, 
uh, ham radio, all that stuff. Of course, there's a shop for Gene Texas. And just like the book, uh, I get a certain percentage uh, cut from the sales uh, that occur if you go there. So if you buy anything from there, I get like anywhere from zero to 6%, excuse me, uh, zero to 6% uh, sales commission. But not only that, but then anything else you buy from Amazon for like the next 24 hours, uh, Amazon tosses me a coin. So cool. Oh, thank you, Blessings Daily. I, I'm rather proud of the book. Okay, and for those who want to fly your foraging Texas flag on your body, of course, there is the Cafe Press uh, store where there's a number of T-shirts and uh, bags and water bottles and stuff like that. Um, so that's good. Ah. <laughs> Adriana, yeah, no, no wine this week. Tomorrow, uh, 9 a.m., I will be in front of the money guy for Medicine Man Plant Co. And I need all cylinders uh, firing there. So, <laughs> hey, Wayne, I will take what I can get. So, as I said, with the Idiot's Guide, they, they did pay me a one-time you know, writing fee. Um, it, it wasn't huge, but it wasn't small either. So, I, at the time, I, I was okay with it. I didn't realize it would become the third best-selling uh, Idiot's Guide ever, though. So, oh, well. Live and learn. Okay. Uh, sponsors. Of course, a big shout-out to Wazoo Survival for, A, working with me to create this really cool foraging bandana, the 12 probably best plants in North America for food and medicine and cordage and fire starting and all that sort of stuff. And did this go up? up. Ah, there we go. Um, but more importantly, Wazoo Survival is also the uh, company that pays for the StreamYard account that I am using to broadcast these shows. It's way better than the Zoom and man, what are the, there was some other thing. I don't even remember what I used to use, but uh, this is working way better. So thank you, Wazoo Survival, for introducing me and paying for the StreamYard uh, so I can do these shows without pulling my hair out because, you know, I don't have much left to pull out. Oops. Oh, you know what I meant to do? Hold on. Let's see here. Do, do, do. Okay. So, of course, the Wazoo Survival foraging bandana. Awesome. And then you know Uncommon Bees. So right now, Uncommon Bees, they are my main supplier of bee stuff. And they want to be your main supplier of bee stuff because they have a lot of stuff that they can supply you. Um, let's see. What to do? Order online. So, I mean, they have beeswax. They have assorted honeys, granulated honeys, and then a ton. Last time I checked, there were 62 different infused honeys. Um, and they actually have their own freeze dryer. So they harvest the plants, freeze dry them, grind them, and then mix them with the honey at their, their place out in Jasper. And actually, Uncommon Bees will be uh, hosting me on September 5th. Uh, I'll be doing two classes out there in the Jasper East Texas area. So you can see there from the Foraging Texas website. Also, if, with Uncommon Bees, now until midnight tonight, with the coupon code Forking Weeds, you get 25% off your order. The rest of the week, Forking Weeds only gets you 10%. But after the show, jump over to Uncommon Bees. I put the link up and check them out, see if there's anything you want. I know there is. Okay. Whoops. Uh, what is going on here? Okay. All right. So Herbs, the other sponsor, or another sponsor, tribe member Ricardo Shilly Shelly. So with Herbs, uh, Herb Shop. So if you're looking for fresh herbs or dried herbs, usually it'll be dried herbs, sorry. 
uh, not mixed in anything. They're the people to talk to. And with them, the Forking Weeds coupon gets you 15% off. Um, located in Cushing, Texas. So they have a walk-in shop, but they will also do Zoom uh, interviews or cons consultations to figure out just what might be the issue. And then from directly you know, talking to you, figure out what may be the best herb or probably mixture of herbs to help you with that situation. So definitely where you want to go for your, your non-honey-based herbs, if you will. Hey, Jenny. Hey, Joe. Hey, Kathleen. Hey, Cleo. Hey, Carrie. Okay. But wait, there's more. So Camp Craft Outdoors, um, absolutely my favorite gear maker. Like I said, if you want heavy duty type, uh, you know, I got my bag here to do. Camp Craft Outdoors, made here in the US. Nice weight canvas, damn near indestructible when you are off trail, whether you are looking for mushrooms or hunting deer or whatever, hunting pigs, uh, regardless of the weather, because everything is hand waxed to make it waterproof. But they have the traditional, what we call bushcraft gear. So, and along with a sort of different waxed canvas sort of goods, uh, they also have some custom outdoor tools specifically for them. Uh, in particular, some different knives that are really, really nice. Uh, highly recommend those. So uh, Camp Craft Outdoors, with them, the coupon code is Foraging Texas, and that gives you a 15% discount anytime. So if you're buying something, you know, one of the cool knives, or if we go back, you know, one of the cool whoop, pouches. You know, it's all there for you. And you can save some money. Okay. And now we have a special deal with fear and dread. Hey, Christina. Hey, Jennifer. So just uh, let me throw this up there. It's, oop. And it, oh, there we go. Okay. So right now, if you you know look over on the Foraging Texas Facebook page, pinned to the top, there is a special giveaway thing going on. Uh, Fear and Dread supplied me with two of the patrol officer, individual patrol officer vacuum packed first aid kit with like the tourniquet and the gloves and the gauze and all the stuff you need uh, in case of a serious trauma. Uh, and the way the world is going right now, very, very handy to have around. So if you go to the Foraging Texas Facebook page, at the very top, there is a post that tells you how you can get entered in the drawing. All you have to do is tag two of your friends uh, and follow the Fear and Dread and Wazoo Survival, because not only will the two people get one of the individual patrol officer kits, but those two people will also get a foraging bandana. So two ways, you know, two winners, two gifts each. Very, very, very cool. So check that out. And then, okay. And then finally, I have a very special, let me bring this up. I need to hold on a second here. And share screen. Application window. One last sponsor here, the uh, Arbor True, arbortrue.com. And let me put them up here. So they have a special deal, deal going. So they're, what, what happened? Something weird happened. I don't know what happened. Hold on. Share. Okay, there we go. Cool. Okay, Arbor True. So right now, uh, they are the best, in my opinion, the best tree doctors like in the Houston, East Texas, Gulf Coast region. And they will come out and diagnose what is wrong with your tree if you have some sort of weird illness. And they have a lot of special techniques they can use to try and save the tree. Or they also do just regular 
uh, tree trimming and pruning. If you have a tree that's rubbing against your roof or power lines or just kind of a little scary there, thinking in a hurricane comes, it's going to fall in the house. Um, if you have them come out and fertilize, or sorry, trim your trees, uh, they will also uh, fertilize your, your yard with this really cool nitrogen fixing uh, material that will bind to the plants, the roots of the plants, and start creating nitrogen from the air. So you want to check that out. And they've also currently worked with uh, the MicroLife. So if you need any sort of tree stuff done now, until whenever, you know, think at least until hurricane season is over with, you want to have Arbor True as, you know, on your speed dial. Okay. Let's see. To do. Hey, Kay. Hey, Amy. Hey, Billy. Uh, we are starting now. Hey, Andrea. So, yeah, that is the sponsors and all the housekeeping stuff. So now let us uh, stop sharing that. Let us go for why you came. And that would be dun 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 the Hackberry. I have lots of pictures of Hackberry. So tonight we're going to learn about Hackberry. Oops. And the reason we're going to learn about Hackberry is because most people who are aware of Hackberries think they are junk trees. So, oops, let me go back to here. Okay. So a lot of people, when they think of Hackberries, they think this tree that is constantly dropping branches and twigs all year round, any sort of wind, making a mess in the fall, covered with these berries, the berries attract the birds. The birds are pooping on everything. The berries are falling to the ground. And next spring, you got all these hundreds of little seedlings growing up. People hate hackberries. Absolutely hate hackberries. That's because humans in general don't understand the gifts around them. So let's talk about hackberry. And let's start by identification. And... By far, the easiest way to uh, recognize a hackberry is by the scaly, warty skin it has. So the overall bark is a mottled gray. It'll have patches of white and gray. And then all over the bark, you will have these flat warts that are made of platelets that grow up. And they'll be up to you know, about half an inch uh, tall. So when the tree is younger, it'll look like this. Side note, if you scratch something into the tree, where you scratched it will trigger the formation of these platelets. Uh, just something to keep in mind. So kind of cool. As the trees get older, they, you know, these platelets get big and close together. And the tree, you know, takes on kind of some sort of prehistoric desert planet sort of look to it if you look really closely. So a fairly attractive tree. Um, they grow about 40 feet tall. And the best description of the shape, and actually I don't have uh, an overview. Well, I can have this one. Nope. Okay. The, so the trees will be 40 feet tall. The leafy part, the branchy part, will be about 25 feet across uh, and about... You know, you'll have a, a trunk that goes up about 25 feet, 20 feet, and then a 25 foot ball of greenery that's just kind of out. Big ball of greenery. Um, like I said, my favorite description of it was someone once said uh, basically, if Albert Einstein's hair was a tree, it would look like a hackberry. So think just kind of this crazy mass on top of a, a, a fairly large trunk. So the individual leaves, if we zoom in close, whoops, I guess it helps if I go here. Uh, hopefully you can see that. You know what? Can I? Aha. Let me close that. Okay. So the individual leaves uh, are two to five inches long, depending on the specific species. They are going to be very dark and somewhat rough on the top. They have real fine hairs that are just kind of randomly pointing in all directions. 
flip it over, the underside is a much lighter color, uh, lighter green to sometimes even yellow. A lot of times they'll be covered with what's called the uh, hackberry nipple gall, which are tiny little bumps that look like nipples uh, that are caused by a particular gall beetle that lays its eggs in the leaves of the hackberry and causes these swollen areas to rise up. The leaves themselves are alternating along the branches, so they're not directly across from each other. They're alternating and zigzagging. Triangular in shape, and they're going to be somewhat asymmetrical at the bottom. And what I mean by that, and do I have a close-up? Yeah, here we go. So if you can see, the, the bottom doesn't go straight across. You have like a, a, a drop side and a raised side. So if I were a hackberry, I'd look like this. <laughs> um, the edges are very, very, very finely serrate. You can kind of see the bumpiness on there, uh, kind of toothed along the edge. All right. Now, the fruit. Doo, doo, doo. The fruit is where it's at. So these are what are called droops, not technically fruit or you know, subcategory, but a droop. So it has a skin, flesh, and then a large pit. So skin, flesh, pit in the center and a fairly large pit. The droops, the, you can see they, they hang from the tree in singular, usually one fruit at the base of each leaf. So every leaf on the tree is very likely to form a fruit. And these fruit will, they're green right now, but they're in the process of turning red. When they're red like this, this is when they are edible. Ooh, here's a good question. So Cleo asks, do the leaves feel like a cat's tongue if you rub it backwards? No, so elm leaves, so slippery elm, American elm, winged elm, but the elm trees, they have a leaf. And on the leaf, all the hairs are pointing towards the end. So on an elm, if you rub your hand from the base to the tip of the leaf, it feels smooth. But if you go backwards, it feels rough like a cat's tongue because all the hairs are pointing that way and you're bending those hairs back. With the hackberry, all the hairs are just kind of sticking straight up or just kind of randomly pointed. And so there's no direction to them. So Regardless of which direction you pet the leaf, it's going to feel pretty much the same. But cool that you remember that that, that might be a, a structural way of identifying the things. Okay, so the fruit be about a, uh, depending on the species, from about a quarter inch in diameter, maybe up to three eighths of an inch in diameter. Uh, reddish to dark purple, and around here, well, Texas, ripening usually in September. So, uh, and we're going to talk more about those when we talk about eating them. I do want to mention that in worldwide, so around the world, there is somewhere between 50 and 75 species of the Celtis, C-E-L-T-I-S, that is the genus Celtis of the hackberry. So 50 to 75, it depends I've said this before, there are grouper botanists and there are splitter botanists and just nomenclature. And the groupers just take a bunch of plants that they say, eh, they're close enough, they're all one species. Whereas splitters go, aha, that leaf is one eighth of a millimeter longer than on this one over here. So those are two completely different species. So trying to, you know, determine how many species there are is constantly in flux as different people uh, post scientific articles and saying, aha, I feel these two are separate. They are not the same species. And I call it, you know, Cetus vortebrugginus, uh, you know, just because, you know, sounds like a good name. And so that's why when we say there are 50 to 75 species worldwide, uh, that's why there's some confusion as to how many. Uh, in North America, there are seven species, and 
in those seven species, there are five variations. So a variation is where, okay, it's kind of different, but not quite different enough to give it its own species, unless you're a splitter. But they're saying, eh, you know, the, these hackberries here and these hackberries way over there um, are mostly the same. There might be some little regional differences going on. But if we brought them together, they could still have viable offspring. So they're probably the same species. So we'll call those variations rather than species. So North America, seven species across North America with five variations. In Texas, we have all seven of those. So all seven of the hackberries available in North America can be found somewhere in Texas Though of the five variations, we only have three variations. So, and if you want more information on that, let me just throw up a link here. Okay. Oh, oh. We have a new person here. Everyone say hi to the new person. Hi, Vicky. Hey, she's even waving. Hi, Vicky. Okay. So, does Hackberry have thorns? No. They have, oh. Ah. Uh, Okay, actually, so in Texas, uh, over in the south and in the west Texas, there is the spiny desert hackberry. So if you, the, the most common one, the sugar hackberry, which is found pretty much all across North America, uh, does not have thorns, but there is a desert version that does have thorns, Vicky. So depending on where you're at, they may or may not have thorns. All right. Hmm. Okay. Andrew makes out a good point here that the younger trees, and do I have any? Uh, ba -bum, ba -bum. I don't think so. I don't have any good pictures of a seedling. Yeah. But the younger trees are going to be much more serrated than the mature leaves. So I guess they're, you know, kind of being young and edgy. Some of us never outgrow that. Okay. Hey, Joe. All right. Um, where was I? So, yeah, do I have? I thought I had. Let me do a thing here. Uh, desert hackberry. Yeah, here we go. So for those of you following around at, along at home, so, uh, okay, desert hackberry, uh, a little rounder leaves, not quite as pointing, but you can kind of see they're still kind of asymmetrical. But do I have a picture? Oh, and there, of course, is the fruit of the desert hackberry. The nice thing about the desert hackberry fruit is it's bigger and sweeter than the common hackberry. Hey, Lewis. Good evening. Hey, Wade. Um, somewhere, but here's some more of the desert hackberry. I thought I... Oh, here we go. Okay. So, yeah. Oops. So, the desert hackberry, wicked-ass thorns on it. You don't want to just randomly grab... Well, you really don't want to randomly grab plants in the desert anyway, because it seems like most of them have thorns. So, yes, yeah, so the desert hackberry... Uh, in the more arid regions uh, down south. So I found this picture uh, was down in the Corpus area, but then there all the way out into West Texas, you find the uh, desert hackberry. All right, cool. We found it, Vicki. See, you came here, you learned something new in your yard. Awesome. So yeah. Um, do I get some more? Oh, I saw a good one just a minute. There. Thorny. But the... Here is a really good picture of one of the other characteristics of hackberries. And those are, this is the desert hackberry, but it's a characteristic that's used to identify all hackberries. If you notice the zigzag of the branch, the young branch, goes zoot, 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 zoot. You know, kind of like Charlie Brown's haircut. Uh, so a zigzagging branch is another way of identifying a hackberry. 
Very cool. I'm glad you're here, Vicky. And then, of course, let's see. Uh, yeah, but also the mottled gray bark. Oh, here we go. Here's a good picture of the thorns with thorns because it is a desert plant. But this is the desert hackberry, which also has the edible fruit. All the hackberries produce edible fruit. Yeah. Oh, here's a good question. Christina. So, yeah, the desert hackberry is more of a multi-trunked, and I apologize for this being sideways, uh, but a more multi-trunk, lower to the ground. It doesn't have a single trunk going up and Albert Einstein here on the top. It is a lower, smaller desert plant uh, with lots of twisted branches around. Oops. Okay. So desert hackberry. And then again, the fruit. I wonder. So this is the desert hackberry. Uh, like I said, you'll find this in South Texas and a little bit in the hill country, uh, but more out in West Texas. The, whoops, I, I guess I should leave it up here. Like all the hackberries, the fruit is edible and it has a nice sweet flavor. The one issue with the desert hackberry is the berries are actually fairly juicy. They have a fair amount of flesh around a small seed, which is really good, but it does interfere with one of the superpowers that the most common sugar hackberry has, the hackberry occidentalis. Um, let's see. Okay. So let me go back. Let me just type in hackberry again. Like I said, this is my own photo collection here. So now, oh, I, I kind of like this one. <laughs> Sometimes if you want to be a forager, you have to put up with things. But here's a good question. Is the desert fruit always orange? So on the desert hackberry, the fruit starts out green, but then does turn orange like that. It doesn't turn the same uh, fire engine red that the sugar hackberry does. So here we go. We got the sugar hackberry. Uh, this was taken in February in the Houston area. The berries are still good in February's on the tree. So assuming the cedar waxwings haven't come through and devoured all of them, uh, basically as long as the fruit is on the tree, it is still edible because that's the superpower about the hackberry. So the seed, well, sorry, the, the whole berry or droop is edible. The skin, the flesh, and the pulp are all edible. Let me just bring up another one here because there was, yeah. So the, the skin, the flesh, and the seed is all edible. The seed is really hard. Um, I would actually recommend not trying to crush the seeds with your teeth. Uh, this is one where you want to bang it between two rocks or some really uh, powerful grinder of some sort to chop it up. So the... Uh, I. I People have taken my class where there's hackberries. I go into a long talk about it. So I'm going to start that now. Calories. Calories come from sugars and protein and oil, basically, in the plant world. And that's something that the hackberries have in abundance. Um, where is this? They, they, okay, so yeah, the fruit, it's uh, high in sugar, fats, and protein. Uh, along with calcium, fiber, and phosphorus. So they're actually very, very, very nutritious, uh, with, especially because they have the protein and fats. And that's kind of rare for, for things. But what's even more rare about the hackberry is it doesn't spoil. And I said, as long as it's on the tree, it's good. You know, they start ripening in September. If you see them in February, you can still eat them. You can also take them and harvest them and dry them some, and they become a storable form of calories. That's pretty rare. Like meat and fat doesn't store. 
acorns, pecans, walnuts, most nuts, the oils in that goes rancid really quickly. Those don't store. But hackberries were a storable form of calories. And they were so important to early mankind that it turns out they are our oldest known foraged food. So if you uh, know anything about Peking man, i just put a post up here so you can see what I'm talking about. The Peking man, these were a series of skeletons found in some caves in central China, not Homo sapiens. They were Homo pecanus, uh, but they were tool makers. They were basket weavers. They were an intelligent species. They just didn't, you know, make it to Homo, you know, class, you know, survive. But they were tool makers. There's belief that they had language. Um, they were smart primates. And in the caves with the Peking mans were found tons and tons and tons of the hackberry shells and hackberries and hackberry pits and all this sort of thing. And so it is believed that there's, there's one competing theory that I will put out there, but it's believed the Peking man collected the hackberries because these trees are found all over the world. And the they are such a good source of storable nutrition that they could collect them in large baskets and store them in the cave. Now, the competing theory as to why these caves were filled with the hackberry seeds, um, and there was evidence in these caves that the, 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 the Peking man species lived there for you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. There's a lot of debris layers and so forth. Um, the, the one theory is that there might have been some hackberry trees growing on the mouth of the cave and the berries fell in the cave and they collected that way. Um, seems pretty unreasonable once you look at the studies in the paper of how much, uh, how many seeds were in there. So, okay, here's a good question. So, did they crush the seeds in ancient times to get the nutrition out of them? Yes, that was the standard uh, procedure. And I'm going to talk about how uh, some different cultures did that and what they did with the seeds. So just uh, hold on there and we, we'll get there. Yes, Nathan. So yeah, you can collect them. What's recommended is you just set them out on a cookie sheet for a week or so just to let the, let the little bit of residual moisture in them evaporate out and then store them up and they are fine. So there's a little bit of moisture. Uh, you just let that dry away and away it goes. Ah, Cynthia, is this the same as farkleberry? No, farkleberry is a soft uh, berry in the viburnum family uh, related to huckleberries and blueberries. The farkleberries are good from about Mid-October into December, after December, they can start getting kind of yicky. Uh, they don't have the calories and none of the protein. Plus, the farkleberries are only found really in Texas and some in Louisiana, not worldwide. But good question, because uh, those of you who have heard me talk about farkleberries have pointed out that you can eat them for months after they ripen. Okay, so Peking man, 500,000 to 750,000 years ago, you know, the intelligent primate species was collecting these, storing these, using them for food. In North America, they go back, uh, in Pennsylvania, there's the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter in Pennsylvania. It's a cave that has... Uh, whoops, did that go up there? Okay, and so they're thinking uh, the humans, this was Homo sapiens now in the Meadowcraft rock shelter, and that goes back 16,000 years ago. So the earliest people, you know, cruising around North America were you know, collecting the hackberries. Uh, this, if you know anything about early cultures in North America, the Clovis culture, uh, they were considered some of the most widespread, the Clovis point. It's a particular type of arrowhead spearhead with very distinctive features. Uh, it's found in a lot of areas across North America. Uh, and for a long time, they were considered the first people in North America. 
uh, but that only goes back 13,000 years. Uh, the Clovis culture has been found out to not have been the first people. But before the Clovis people, the first, what we think were the first people here, were already eating the hackberries here. So that's cool. Uh, Central Turkey. Those of you who ever go to Central Turkey, the communities there. Uh, this was another staple food of them. So and that was going back 7,000 to 9,000 years ago. They had big pits of, of the hackberries that they had collected and stored. So the, oh, where is it? Okay, this, this is something that hopefully you all will find interesting. So if you remember back in... Let me just bring me up here. In you know your high school literature or maybe a college literature, when you read Homer's Odyssey, and there was the section of the lotus eaters, where they you know as uh, Odysseus was sailing back to Crete and being waylaid by gods and sent all over the place, they came across the island of the lotus eaters, and the people on that island, all they did was sitting there and ate the the fruit of the lotus tree and didn't want to do anything else and so a lot of researchers believe in that situation what the tree homer was actually describing based on the descriptions and so forth not the narcotic effects but the overall sweet flavor and so forth was that uh the lotus eaters were actually eating the mediterranean hackberry so that's kind of cool all right, let's see. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, okay, yes. So uh, let's go on to how the different Native Americans, especially the Texas Native Americans, use that because adding it to pemmican was one of the ways of doing it. Those of you who don't know pemmican, pemmican is a mixture of dried meat and tallow and assorted uh, fruits, well, dried fruits and nuts made into a meaty, fatty, fruity bar that was absolutely fantastic nutritional uh, food. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, jumping from Odysseus and the Odyssey to North America. So when the fruit were ripe, the different Native Americans would take it and mash it into a paste. So the whole fruit, the skin, the flesh, the seed, all that mashed it together and uh, made it into a paste. Now, what the different tribes did with that paste varied from tribe to tribe. So the Kiowa uh, would mash it and then add uh, other fruits and nuts to it into this paste make a thick dough out of it, of the mashed up hackberry and the fruits, wrap it around a stick and bake it like stick bread. So they would you know, mash up the hackberry, make the paste, mix other fruits and nuts with it and bake it into a spiral storable granola bar sort of thing. Pretty cool. Uh, if you are making stick bread, just a little side note here, you want to go with a branch about an inch in diameter, strip out the bark, make sure it's a non-toxic wood, preheat the wood over the fire. You want to get it hot before you wrap the dough around it and then continue baking. Otherwise, it's going to be cooked on the outside and kind of raw on the inside. So the kiwa, they would make a stick bread out of it. The Comanche would take the paste and just roll it into balls and bake those. And then they would just have these, there was just hackberry, you know, ground up hackberry paste balls. Uh, if you're familiar with marzipan, kind of like that. So grind it up, pack in a ball, roast it some, and away they'd go. The Osage, the Apache, and the Mescalero would form it into snack cakes. Think like little Debbie snack cakes. So they would take the paste, they'd mash up the hackberries, form it into cakes, bake the cakes, and use those and store those and take those with them. And then the Meskawaki would take them and boil them into a porridge. 
Uh, you don't hear much about the Meskawaki, but yeah, they were another Native American tribe around here. But they would take the hackberries, mash them up, and cook them and store them. And then they had storable, or sorry, they would make the porridge out of it. So they would keep the, the dried paste and then boil it when they were ready to use it. So pretty cool. Now, that's neat because they could take these, these, these really high-fat, high-protein, sweet-flavored berries, droops, crush them up, and you know do stuff with it. But they had storable calories. And I need a drink of water here. <laughs> so now let's go back in time again, way back to the earliest humans. And something that you may not have realized is during the span in which Homo sapiens existed on the earth, which is a, in a blink of an eye in ge geological times, but we've been around for, you know, longer than you probably think. I think it's like somewhere around 60,000 years or so. During that time, we've had approximately 12 different ice ages. So 12 different times, the ice came from the poles of north, you know, north and the South Pole and creeped up and you know, forced everyone out and you know, uprooted everything. And so they uh, you know, had everything destroyed as the ice came in and they were you know, trying to stay warm and huddled you know, around the equator areas. During those times, the cultures that survived were areas that were high in hackberries because the hackberry, it's a very durable tree. It can handle pretty extreme temperatures found all over the world. And they had storable calories. When the you know animal fats and stuff weren't available, when the nuts had all turned rancid or just weren't producing because it was too damn cold, um, at least with the hackberries, we're still producing, you know, every leaf produced a berry. And then the you know early humans would uh my understanding is the easiest way to get the berries they would just chop the tree down because the trees themselves are very fast growing uh they only live 20 30 years max fairly well you might have if you have it you notice it's it's uh not a really hard or dense wood it's somewhat tough um and somewhat springy and we'll talk about that in a bit but usually it's easy to just chop the tree down and strip the berries and go to the next one. And, you know, they, they weren't exactly environmentally friendly harvesters. So, yeah, uh, they collect it. The theory is that the humans that survived these 12 ice ages survived because they were in areas rich in hackberries. And they had these storable calories that they could get through the you know, basically that apocalyptic ice age 12 times. So I tell people, the reason you are here on earth, at least why you, is because one of your ancestors, you know, sometime during those 12 ice ages was lucky enough to be in an area that had the hackberry, uh, hackberry trees. So pretty cool. Uh, basically, one could argue the human race owes its existence to the hackberries because we were able to harvest and eat and store these to get us through those times. Ooh, this is an interesting. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, animal traps, a lot of animals really like the hackberry. Not sure about fish. The seed is very hard and the pulp around the seed is very small. Now, if you chopped it up, broke it up, crushed it up, maybe you could use it to kind of chum the waters to attract fish, but definitely it's a good trap bait for your basic uh, berry and nut eating animal. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah, so 12 ice ages, humans survived them, go hackberries. Nowadays, people hate them. The wood. Uh, actually, let's talk a little bit more about uh, how to take the berries and some things you can do with them. So uh, mortar and pestle, two rocks, something to crush it. Because again, I said the seed is too hard. You do not want to try and crush the seed with your teeth. 
Um, be very careful. If you try, you don't want to break a tooth, uh, especially the Cro-Magnum and the Peking Man had these huge jaws and really strong jaw muscles and big grinding teeth that they could eat those things and crush them up. Homo sapiens, no. We were smart enough to bang rocks together. So, uh, you know, you want to crush it up. A good grinder, like a just a uh, a blender, probably not going to do anything. A blender might chop up the skin and the flesh some, but it's probably not going to do a whole lot to the seeds. So you need something that actually grinds, like a, a flour grinder, flour mill, mortar and pestle, something like that. You can grind up the entire berry uh, into a paste like the Native Americans did. And like I said, it's kind of like a marzipan, but red. <laughs> this one here. Very thirsty. Um, and from there, you can you know, bake it into a, you know, a survival cake, if you will, a, a source of calories that you can store and eat. Uh, once it's been baked and made into the cake, you know, don't pack it so it's rock hard. You kind of want it loosely packed, just enough to, to stick together. Because otherwise, if you pack it really hard and bake it, you're going to break your teeth trying to break it off. So you don't want to make hard tack out of it. You want to make it a little softer from it. Ooh, here's a good question. Yeah, can you propagate them or grow them from seed? Yes. <laughs> so all you need to do is find a hackberry tree uh, and really basically starting uh, mid-September, start collecting this the, the fruit. If you want, pop in the mouth. You know, use your teeth and tongue to remove the skin and the pulp. Nice sweet flavor. Spit out the seed, plant the seed, away you go. Um, it's one of those that a lot of the seeds stay intact through animals' digestive tracts, unless they have a really strong gizzard where they have you know the gravel and stuff to break it up. But the uh they like going through you know intestinal tracts and get planted with a little bit of fertilizer. But yeah, once they grow, they're they're quick growing, they're fast growing, uh, lifespan 20 to 30 years, and in that time they get about 40 feet tall. So if you have your basic suburban yard, you may not want it, or you might want to see if you can do it in a big pot. I'm not sure if you can get big enough in a pot to produce the berries. It might, uh, but it'd be worth trying. But the problem uh, is 20, 30 years later, it's dead and you got to take it down, in which case you contact Arbor True with their board certified uh, arborists. So cool. That worked perfectly. I wonder, uh, hey, Arbor True, are you watching tonight? I haven't seen your name. Uh, okay, here's a good question. Uh, easier way to collect the droops other than chopping the tree down? Yeah, so usually the trees. They'll start producing fruit about 10 feet tall. You can reach a lot. You can just pull them off. Uh, you don't have to chop the tree down. You know, reach what you can. Usually where there's one hackberry tree, there's going to be a lot of hackberry trees. And so you just pick, 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 pick. It's a little time consuming, but it's fairly straightforward. That's a good question. How cold can they go? Um, I mean, the hackberries are found up in Minnesota. They're found up in Canada. They're found in, you know, China, you know, pretty much wherever trees are found, there's hackberry trees. So in the hackberry, uh, the Celtis occidenta, occidentalis goes all over the place. So they can handle Minnesota and that'll get down negative 25 at times, eh, negative 15. <laughs> I wonder what the neighbors would feel about a hackberry and dandelion landscape. They would hate you, Sherry. They would really hate you because they are ignorant. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, and actually, so that's true. If you cut the, the stump, it, it, it's what's called co uh, coppicing, where you cut the tree and then let the new suckers grow up from it. And the suckers are nice. You can use them for different things. One of the things that the wood, uh, hackberry wood was actually used for is bow and arrows. Twang sort of thing. Uh, even though people that have the hackberries trees are used to the branches breaking in storms, once the branches get fairly thick, 
they uh, don't break as much or they break off at a joint. But the wood itself was considered in you know, the top three woods for making bow and arrows out of, you know, with the Osage orange being way up there. And then the second one was usually kind of depending on where in North America it was, but then the hackberry, everyone had hackberry. So they like the hackberry uh, bow and arrows too. It carves well. It has a white color to it. Not great firewood. Uh, doesn't have a lot of BTUs in it because it's not a very dense wood. Um, but uh, as far as carving, a number of the uh, fancy churches in Texas, the missions, uh, a lot of the scroll work and the decorative carved surfaces were hackberry. Kind of cool. So it's using like cabinetry, cabinetry carved, decorative, woodwork type, trim type things like that. Okay. Oh, here's a good question. Are there other uh, properties other than nutritive? So I haven't looked much into that. Traditionally, they had some medicinal properties, but looking over them, they were the same nutritional properties they assigned to every plant that they just figured, well, let's just try this on the sick person and see what happens. So it's mainly food, bow and arrow, and wood carvings. Ah, Joe Lynn and Joe Lynn have found themselves. And what's funny is I always in my mind, you were the, both the same people. Mike, is it okay to prune to reachable height? It's not going to hurt it. So, you know, go with that. Uh, Luis, okay. And then just that, yeah. So it's technically a hardwood, but hardwood in the same way like willow is a hardwood. So it's not very dense, uh, fairly soft. Uh, my understanding is it doesn't shrink much and it doesn't like warp much when it dries. So it was good for carving uh, stuff. But as a uh, firewood, no, nah, very low BTUs. Uh, pretty fire, but fairly quick burning, not a lot of heat. All right. What time is it? Oh, wow. 8.56. Okay. Um, another thing you can do with it, whoops, let me just close this, is make hackberry milk. So if you are familiar with almond milk, you kind of do the same thing, but where you take the hackberry berries, you crush them up, and then you take one part berry and two parts water. So if you have end up with one cup of crushed berries, then you add it to two cups of water. If you come up with one quart of crushed berries, you add it to two quarts of water. So one part berries, two parts water. Boil it together until the volume has reduced by half. So you've driven off about half of the water. Let it sit overnight. You know, just put a lid on it, turn the heat off, let the berries and the water sit overnight. And then the next morning, use some cheesecloth or something like that to strain out the, the crushed berry material. And you will have a very delicious hackberry sweet almond milk sort of drink from it. So kind of cool that way. Um, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like the porridge. You could probably eat the plant material, you know, the, the stuff that you strained out, kind of like the uh, Kiowa. Uh, wait, which ones was it? Oh, the, the, sorry, the Meskawaki uh, would make the porridge out of it. So you boil it, strain out the water, eat the plant material, and drink the fluid, and there you go. Okay. Uh, wow. Okay, two minutes. This worked out perfectly. So, yeah, hackberries. Mankind's food since before we were humans pretty much got us through the really terrible times of the human race being almost wiped out by ice ages and things of that nature. Uh, found all over the world. Modern mankind hates it because they're messy, they're short-lived, they produce lots of berries, that produce lots of babies, uh, not realizing we are here because of it. Because one of our ancestors, or I guess lots of our ancestors, you know, way back at some point was lucky enough to be 
somewhere where the hackberries were, and so they survived and survived, reproduced, da -da 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 -da, to make it to you know to you. Yeah. I, okay. So, Jolyn, you could do that. A lot of the sugars would be removed, but the protein is still going to be there. So it's going to be somewhat bland in flavor. Uh, at that point, you're probably best mixing it with some other dried fruit, like dried pineapple or mango or things like that. Okay, 859. Uh, just a quick scan here. If I missed any questions. And I have to apologize if I miss questions, uh, just because I am talking and juggling a bunch of things here trying to get out there. So... Um, I'll try and catch them if if and I go back after the show and go through and answer them again. Uh, otherwise, thank you. Hopefully, I expanded your connection to nature a little bit more tonight. That's what I'm trying to do. Help you realize the miracles around us because they're pretty dang miraculous. All right, everyone. Have a great night. Tribe, I will see you tomorrow. This same location at the donut shop at the beginning of the world, 7.30 to 8 a.m. As usual, I have no idea what the topic will be because it's just a free-flowing discussion as we sit around the donut table and drink coffee and pretend to eat donuts. All right, everyone. Love you. Thank you for spending your hour with me. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.